Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Um, I have a short verse I want to read to you. It's Psalm 36, 7. Um, well, this version says how precious. The one at, that I have at home says how excellent. Um, so how excellent is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Um, the song I'm going to sing today basically just speaks to God's great love and grace toward us and our response, which is that it's to do something that he asks us to do. And um, this song, it just really touches my heart a lot. God's been asking me to do a lot of things lately that don't really even make sense to me. Um, but I know he's moving in my life and, and directing me, you know, the ways that I'm going. And I'll tell you, it's the hardest thing ever. It's the most rewarding and the hardest thing ever. Because when he asks you to go out and do stuff for him, it, it's just involves so much faith and so much attack from Satan all at the same time. Um, and it's, but it's such an incredible experience. And um, he just loves me so much and gives me so much grace all the time that it just keeps pushing me forward to do the things he asks. Oh, uh -huh. 
morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Some of you may be, have looked around to try to find the rest of me. My husband and my two kids, but unfortunately they're not here today. They are home sick. They say hi to you all and they miss being here. I miss them being here. Well, we have a day coming up on Monday. Does anybody know what that day is? Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Most people, when they think of Valentine's Day, think of romance, or chocolates, or flowers, or special dinners out. But that's not what I think about. Although my husband is number one on my Valentine's Day list, he's not the only one that I think about. To me, Valentine's Day is about love. Love for everyone especially those who really need it during this time. Like my neighbor who lost her husband about six months ago to cancer and is spending her first Valentine's Day alone without him since their marriage. Or like my grandmother who's lying in a nursing home dying in fear and loneliness, spending a Valentine's there. Or like my sister-in-law who just got the call this morning that her eight-year-old student passed away with cancer, and her <coughs> the student's family, who now has to have that memory. And the many other friends and family that I have that are going through hard times right now. My thoughts are, what can I do for them? What can I do to ease their pain? Let's pray. Dear Father God in heaven, it's such an honor to be up here to let you work through me to present the message that you want to present today. I pray that my words will be your words, Father, and that you will touch the hearts of everyone here and everyone that watches this. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to start with sharing a story. It's called A Simple Gesture. It's really fine print, so bear with me on this. Mark was walking home from school one day when he noticed that the boy ahead of him had tripped and dropped all the books that he was carrying, along with two sweaters, a baseball bat, a glove, and a tape recorder. Mark knelt down and helped the boy pick up his scattered things. Since they were going the same way, he helped to carry the burden. As they walked, Mark discovered the boy's name was Bill, that he loved video games, baseball, and history, that he was having a lot of trouble with his other subjects, and that he had just broken up with his girlfriend. Mark went home after dropping Bill at his house. They continued to see each other around school, had lunch together a couple of times, then they both graduated from junior high school. They ended up at the same high school, where they had brief contacts over the years. Finally, the long-awaited senior year came. Three weeks before graduation, Bill asked Mark if they could talk. Bill reminded him of the day years ago when they first met. Do you ever wonder why I was carrying so many things home? asked Bill. You see, I cleaned out my locker because I didn't want to leave a mess for anyone. I had stored away some of my mother's sleeping pills, and I was going to commit suicide. But after we spent some time together talking and laughing, I realized that if I killed myself, I would have missed that time and so many others that might follow. So you see, Mark, you picked up my books that day. You did a lot more. You saved my life. I share that story because there are so many people that are alone, hurting, feeling unwanted and uncared for in this world. I know because I used to be one of them. My sermon is titled, It's Not All About Me. Because if you give your life to Jesus, you realize life's not all about you or your troubles. It's about Jesus and his story and what he did and is doing for you and through you. Today I will share with you what he has done for me and can do for you. Let us first turn to the 
the story of the lost sheep in Luke 15, verses 4 through 7. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just per persons who need no repentance. You see, I was a lost sheep. We've all been there. Some of us are still there. The good news is, we don't have to stay lost. And we don't have to stay in a life of sin and emptiness. John 3.16 tells us, and you all know this one by heart, so please say this one with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that to whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God has also promised us to work in us until we are complete. Philippians 1.6 says, He who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that in the eyes of God, I am worth something. Amen. You are worth something. Amen. We are worth far more than we can imagine despite our wretched state. Amen. By second grade, I'd already been sent to the principal's office. I hadn't done what they said, but unfortunately I'd already gained that reputation, so they thought it was me. By sixth grade, I'd lost my recess privileges because they couldn't control me on the playground. I got in too many fights. So I got to sit with the teachers while the rest of the kids had fun. I drank. My parents got divorced that year, resulting in 20 plus years of not seeing my dad. But there's actually a good ending to that story of not seeing my dad. I'm gonna take a little brief step away so I can share that story with you because it's gotta be shared. I had tried to find him more than once, once I became a Christian, and had located him and then lost him and located and lost him. And then finally, um, my husband and I had our first child, and it was getting close to Christmas, and I was sending out Christmas cards, and I felt that I should send my dad a card. But I was like, where to? <laughs> I don't know where he lives. And so, um, I prayed about it, I went online and I searched and I came up with three addresses. And I'm from Massachusetts, and I think one of the addresses was Vermont and a couple were Maine. And I felt like I should just take this last address that I thought would be the most recent, and so I addressed it and I put pictures in there of his granddaughter so that he'd know he was a grandfather. And I put my email address so that he could contact me if he wanted to. So I mailed it off, and I prayed about it every day, and I told God, this is the last time I'm going to do this, and if you want him in my life, then have him contact me. If you don't, then I fully accept that, and I know that it's best. And so each day I prayed. And a few days went by, and I checked my email every day to see if there was a response. And finally, Sabbath morning came, and I thought, well, I'm going to check before I go to church. So I got on, and there was a response. It wasn't from him, it was from his wife. And she said, I want you to know we got the letter and the card and the pictures. And your father's trying to get his thoughts together before he responds. He is going to respond, but I also wanted to share the miracle of how we got the car. Because we have a P.O. box in the town next to the town we live in. We never get mail delivered to our house. But we had a mailman come yesterday and deliver the card personally to us. So we believe it was a miracle that we got it. 
So God definitely wanted him to contact me. <laughs> so we, he finally came around and ended up talking a few times on the phone. And then we had another child. And um, my dad does have health problems. And so we thought there's got to be some time we can meet at least once. So we planned a visit October 2009. He met me in Pennsylvania. We met halfway, and he met my husband for the first time and our two kids for the first time. That was a very interesting experience. Obviously, he's aged a lot, and so it was just, it was good. The kids took right to him and everything, and it was as if the years, 20-some-odd years, had passed. It was good. God worked everything out. So miracles still happen. And don't give up if you're waiting on miracles in your life. Amen. Okay, back to my story. By seventh grade, I smoked, and I dated 12th graders. To explain that, how I even had access to 12th graders. Where I'm from, high school was 7th through 12th grade. So we're all in the same building. And I started an all-girls game called the Renegades. And I designed our jackets. And, um, my nickname was Speed, not because of the drug speed, but because I could take somebody down faster than anyone else in a fight. The game didn't obviously go very far because the next year, or the, that summer, I would move south. And that year I also, before we moved south, contemplated suicide. My mom was remarrying, and um, we were going to be moving south, and on top of all the other hate that I had, I didn't want this. And so I thought I would just end it all, and I carried a knife. So, and my mom and my grandmother weren't home during the day, they were working. So after school, I was in my room with the door shut, and I was standing there in the middle of my room with the knife on this wrist, thinking how easy it would be just to slice it. And as I was about to, my brother threw my door open, and I dropped the knife and looked at him, and he said, what you doing? He didn't see the knife. He had no clue. And I just looked at him, and I said, uh, nothing. And he shut the door and left. And I stood there for a while and decided I couldn't do it. Yeah. God was definitely working in my life even though I did not know him then. By ninth grade, I planned to run away. Now we were already living, we'd moved down to the south, and we were already living here, but unfortunately lots of my problems still followed. And um, I had two friends who wanted to run away also. So one day we got together and we planned how we were going to steal a car, and we were going to run away and what we were going to do. But thank God again, <laughs> That, that never came about. It ended up failing. And then I got a call from my best friend back home. She was a year younger than me, so this time I was about 15, and she was about 14. And she told me she couldn't live anymore. She hated life. She'd had an abortion, and she couldn't stand the guilt of the abortion. And I could tell she was fading in and out. And I, I said, are you OK? And she said, no, I drank a bottle of vodka with my mother's value. So I immediately panicked. And I went running upstairs and told my mom. And my mom ran next door and called 911. And I told, she told me to just keep her talking. And so I did. And um, I could hear the paramedics when they got there on the other end. And the last thing she said to me before they um, got her off the phone was, I hate you. I hate you. She did survive. And I don't have contact with her anymore. And I know the life she lives up there, the life most of them do live. A lot of my friends in jail are dead. And I know she has had a boyfriend in the past from talking to different people that have put her in a hospital. 
I was filled with tons of hate and tons of anger over most of my childhood and teenage years. I was so unhappy and I felt there was no hope for anything in this world, especially me. I felt unlovable, unwanted, and unloved, and I spent most nights crying myself to sleep. More bad things would occur in my life before I would find Jesus. But I have to say, and some of you are going to think this is absolutely insane, but I am so very thankful for every bad thing that has happened to me, including the things that I cannot mention up here to you today. Because if it wasn't for those things, I don't believe I would be here right now. Up here, loving life and loving Jesus and having a wonderful husband and two beautiful kids and a wonderful church family and friends. My problem, I thought life was all about me. This is a me, me, me world we live in. I saw only the bad things in my life and was completely blind to any good. Prior to knowing Jesus, I spent a lot of time harping on the past, all the bad in my life, complaining to others about the bad life that I've lived. I was lost and I didn't know it. I didn't know that I needed Jesus. I didn't know about forgiveness and the healing that I could have. In 1995, the Raleigh Church had what was called Net 95 Evangelistic Series, a five-week program, and I got an invitation for the first night. Somebody called me up, asked me to come to the first night, and immediately I responded, no because I was thinking I didn't need anyone, including God. But something the next day was eating at me. Now I know it was the Holy Spirit, then I didn't know what it was, other than this nagging little thought that, oh, you should just go. Just once is not going to hurt you. Just go. So the next day, I knew that they, they told me that it was a five-week series and I was going to be serving it so many nights in a row. So the next day, after that thought was bugging me, I finally called them up and said, okay, when's the next night? They said tonight. I said, okay, I'll go. I'm going once. Well, I went that night and I went for the rest of the series, only missing a total of two nights out of the whole five weeks. Towards the end of the series, I think there was maybe just a few nights left. I woke up on a Sunday morning, and I remember the sun shining through my window. I lived alone. And I sat up in bed, saw, look, looking at the sun sh shining in, and like all of a sudden it hit me. I felt good. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> What's this feeling about? You know, I've never felt good. And so I actually panicked. And I closed my eyes and I thought about all the bad things that used to make me angry and want revenge and everything. And I, was, I couldn't cry. I couldn't get mad. I was like, well, this is wonderful. And I jumped out of bed and I was like, God, this is awesome. Thank you. And I said, you just gave me a hope that I didn't know existed. And I said, you know what? I'm going to honor you, God. The first child I have, I'm going to name them Hope after you. <laughs> and it sure is a good thing that our first child was a girl. <laughs> I knew it was going to be a girl because, you know, you go to find out what you're going to have. Well, before we went to find out what we were going to have, I told Leah, I said, well, you know, we don't even have to go get that test because I know it's going to be a girl. And Leah's like, well, I don't know. And I was like, I know it's going to be a girl, because God knows that I'm going to keep my promise. And we're going to name a girl Hope, not a boy. So what happened? He happened. He loved. He healed. He promised. He forgave. He gave new life. He gave hope, literally. I realized it's not all about me. It's his story, not mine. When you share your story, your testimony, with others, 
You are sharing his story. Your testimony is about the power of Jesus and what he can do when you give him your life. I recognized and accepted my need of a Savior, Jesus. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who have sinned? All. all. Isaiah 64.6, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. Despite this wretched state we are in, God still loves us. And he thinks we are worth his son dying on the cross for us. Matthew 1, 21. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Amen. Amen. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because of him there is hope. You are worth something. Don't forget that. I'd like to share a quote from my Bible. I have notes that came in my Bible, and this is a quote from it. When we accept Jesus, we receive him into our lives as not only Savior, but Lord. Man, wonderful things happen. First of all, our sins are forgiven. What a relief to have our guilt removed. We are clean again. In fact, Forgiveness means that we are accepted by God at that moment as if we had never sinned. Jesus changed my life. The more I sought him, the more I changed and healed. Our character and the way we live only changes by spending time with him. We can't change ourselves no matter how hard we try. Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him, and he with me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Psalm 103, 2-4 Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction. I was headed down a path of destruction, and he redeemed me from it. Jesus is waiting to change your life, too. Will you open the door and let him in? I was forgiven, and then I needed to forgive. For most people, this is the hardest part for them to do. And it cannot be done alone. Ephesians 1.7 In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Colossians 3.13 Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. Forgiving those who have hurt you isn't easy, and you can't do it without Jesus' help. I know, I wanted revenge. But once I surrendered to Jesus and asked him to help me forgive, I was able to do it. It doesn't mean I've forgotten what's happened. It means it can't hurt me or control my life anymore. Unforgiveness and anger will destroy you. In the book Beyond Anger by Larry Yeagley, he states, Clinging to anger and nursing it can interrupt the healthy flow of healing, and it slams the door on a positive future. Unforgiveness and anger will completely destroy you. Our adult Sabbath school lesson just, that just ended in the past December was about background characters, and there was a statement in there that I love so much I had to include it in here. We need to be careful about dwelling on what happened in the past at the expense of living correctly in the present. That is so important. I'd also like to share a quote 
of, by Paul Boise. Forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it does enlarge the future. Forgiveness also does not mean equal amnesia. Luke 24, verses 39 through 40, and John 20, verses 27 through 28, tell us that Jesus still has the scars. He sees you and I in those scars, and he smiles. Now that's love, because you and I each put those scars there. My past no longer hurts me, because I see Jesus covering the pain. I surrendered and came to Jesus. I'd like to share a quote from the book Broken Chains by Doug Batchelor. When the prodigal son returned home, acknowledging his failures, his father received him, <coughs> kissed him, embraced him, and then covered his filth and nakedness with his own best robe. Likewise, Jesus is waiting to clothe us with his righteousness, but we, <coughs> but we come home as we are. I think that part is so important that we come home as we are, because I hear so many people tell me, I can't go to church until I get my life together. I'm sorry, but Jesus is waiting for you, and you can't be healed without him. You have to come. <coughs> Church is not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. I found peace. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The world will deceive, try to deceive you by making you think that money, material things, power, etc. will give you the peace you long for, if only you can get enough. But that's not true. How much is enough? No amount of money, things, or fame can offer the peace that Jesus has waiting for you. I found hope. Peter 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I found love. 1 John 4, 7 through 9. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. I found I was not alone anymore. Once you accept him in, you no longer have to face the challenges of life alone. Joshua 1.9 has become one of my most favorite verses. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. My message for you today is of love and forgiveness. Every day you have a chance to receive the hurting, the lonely, and the lost. Some are sitting in church here with you today. How will you receive them? Will you judge the way they look, act, live, or are your arms open and ready to welcome them home? Jesus is calling them and he's waiting for you to bring them in. If I had walked in here 30 years ago, now I'm dating myself. Would I have received a warm welcome? Would your children have been allowed to associate with me? Because I still walk through the doors of churches all over the world today. A few people from the Raleigh Church loved me in, and I will never forget them. Who will you love in? I'd like to leave you with a mission statement. It's from the House of Hope. It's a home in Clayton for troubled teenage girls ages 12 to 17. I used to volunteer there before I got married and had kids. And they have a mission verse, and today I ask you to please make this your mission verse also. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me 
to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from the darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for display of his splendor, from Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. Father God in heaven, I thank you so much for you giving me this opportunity today to share this message and giving me the strength to do so. I pray that everyone will go from here today having a heart of forgiveness and a heart of love for others, and that we can continue to spread your wonderful message of love and forgiveness. Thank you, Father God. In your name, your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our closing song is I Surrender All, page 309 in your hymn. <laughs>
thank you for giving your son to die for us on the cross. When we didn't deserve it, Father, you still love us, and you still believe we were worth something. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen.